Let's break down one of the most impressive studies comparing the effects of ultra processed foods versus unprocessed foods and how that impacts your body composition. This is a really well-controlled, well-designed clinical study where individuals were randomized to either eat 14 days in a metabolic ward of ultra-processed foods that were presented in the same proportions, meaning the macronutrients, the calories, and so forth, compared to an unprocessed food diet. And what was unique about this feeding study is after 14 days, each individual, based upon their randomization, flipped the diet. So some individuals started the 14-day feeding study on an unprocessed food diet and then ended with 14 days of processed foods and other individuals based upon their randomization. As you can see here, the graphical abstract of the study design started with processed foods and ended with unprocessed foods. Now, what was unique about this study is they not only looked at body composition, looking at body fat percentage via DEXA, as well as muscle mass changes. They also looked at body weight, of course, and they looked at blood work. And so we're going to review all of that today. What I think is really interesting, and you can see from the study titled, Ultra Processed Diets Cause Excess Calorie Intake and Weight Gain, an Inpatient Randomized Controlled Trial of Ad Libitum Food Intake. So again, what's unique about this is the investigators presented equal and, and identical amounts of macronutrients to the study subjects. And a unique finding that was statistically significant was when individuals were presented the ultra processed foods, they consumed on average 500 more calories per day. And what was interesting about that is those 500 calories were roughly partitioned between 250 calories ish of fat and 250 calories extra from carbohydrate, whereas protein intake was virtually identical. So this also the study also helps support a hypothesis that we've been talking about a lot, and that is the protein leverage hypothesis that we're gonna dive into shortly. But as you can see from the graphical abstract, the individuals in just 14 days that were randomized to eat a processed food diet or were presented with ultra processed foods, they gained about two pounds. In contrast, the individuals that were presented with unprocessed foods lost about a pound. And I think this is really interesting because as we know, ultra processed foods are designed to be hyper palatable. The flavor profiles, the uh, synthetic additives and different you know, maltodextrin and different uh, flavoring profiles, as well as just the crunchiness, you know, how these foods are manipulated and so forth in, in laboratory settings to increase their consumption. And this has been long known and we're going to talk about what these investigators found here. Now, as you can see from figure one, this is an overview of the study designed. They say 20 adults were confined to the metabolic ward at the NIH Clinic Center, where they were randomized to consume either an ultra-processed or unprocessed diet for two weeks consecutively, followed immediately by the alternate diet. Every week, subjects spent one day residing in a respiratory chamber to measure energy expenditure, respiratory quotient, and sleeping energy expenditure. So I think this is really interesting because it highlights how processed food is more fattening than you might think. And it's so easy to overconsume. And I think this is a really big point that people should understand because it's hard to have moderation of processed food. It's hard to have one Dorito or one bite of a corn dog or one sip of a soda. And the food companies, this is sort of their angle is they say, you know what, we're not really directly causing ill health in people's you know, lives and so forth. We're not contributing to chronic disease because we think that these calories can be consumed in moderation. The, re the reality is most people cannot titrate their calories of ultra processed food. It's very hard to just have a bite of a Pop-Tart. You really are inclined to eat the entire Pop-Tart. We're gonna review the blood work changes, the glucose changes, insulin changes, as well as body composition changes. These people readily cons over consumed about 500 calories per day, roughly partitioned between uh, carbohydrates and fat. Okay, so I think this is really interesting. What was also interesting about this study, because it was a metabolic ward, these individuals actually exercised for 20 minutes every day. And I think that's important because it seems that the exercise helped to offset some of the uh, deleterious changes. Now, it would be even more interesting to see if these individuals didn't exercise and how much weight they would gain if they uh, just consume these processed foods. Okay, now here's another interesting finding. So the weekly cost for the ingredients to prepare the 2,000 calorie per day of ultra processed meals was estimated to be just $106 per week versus $150 per week for the unprocessed meals, as calculated using the cost of ingredients obtained from a local branch of large super supermarket chains. 
So this is challenging because a lot of people do highlight the fact that whole foods, unprocessed, healthier foods cost more. And uh, the to a tune of about, and this was in 2019. I mean, in today's dollars, we're talking about 500 extra dollars per month, roughly, because of inflation, which is really, I think, quite sad. And so uh, eating healthier and eating more unprocessed foods is sadly more expensive. And we can blame our government and politicians for that because of the farm bill. The farm bill is, is subsidizing soda through the WIC program, uh, all sorts of ultra processed foods, Gatorade, Pop-Tarts, um, and a lot of you know, really unhealthy food items. So that is something that you need to vote with your dollar, but also when you go to vote, uh, you know, for Congress uh, individuals, senators, as well as, um, you know, policymakers, see where they stand in, in terms of the relationships they have with big food companies. Okay, so let's look here at figure two, and we can see the energy intake. It was statistically significantly higher on every single day of the 14-day feeding study compared to the unprocessed foods. And of course, that led to increased fat mass changes uh, as well as a bunch of other metabolic health related parameters, including changes in ghrelin and appetite hormones that we're going to get to. Now, what was interesting about this, as you can see, part C of this figure is where the calories really came in. There wasn't a, a huge, significant, uh, a statistically significant difference in the calorie intake at dinner. It actually more occurred during breakfast and lunch. So I think that's interesting because we know around lunchtime, people can be a little bit tired or uh, maybe need uh, an afternoon uh, push. You know, they, they, they have been working or doing whatever they were doing in the morning. So it seems that a lot of people overconsumed calories at lunchtime, which is, in my opinion, a little bit surprising. Uh, most of the clients that I've worked with, their problem time of the day is actually in the evening time, but that wasn't found in this study. Most of the ultra processed foods were consumed, overconsumed at lunchtime as well as breakfast meal eating rate. I think this is really interesting. Part F, you can see here, uh, ultra processed foods are eaten a lot faster. As you know, it's really easy to eat a Pop-Tart compared to a, a grass-fed ribeye steak. I mean, the, the steak is going to take you 15 minutes. You can wolf down a Pop-Tart in 90 seconds or less. And so I think part of that is the eating rate and that we know that satiety kicks in these signals of the mechanoreceptors in the stomach. The stretch receptors take a long time, much longer uh, to actually signal back to your brain that you are starting to get full. So the main takeaway here from, from these images, as well as the findings, is that ultra-processed foods are easier to to consume and people eat them much faster. And that of course leads to weight gain. And we're going to talk about the calorie consumption as well as blood parameters shortly and the protein leverage hypothesis. But first, I want to thank you for being here. Hopefully you're enjoying this content and the study breakdown. If you are, please hit that like button. Thank you for subscribing. That goes a long way and helps the algorithm so that, that other people like you who are interested in learning about metabolic health get access to this information. But because we're talking about appetite and metabolic health, I do want to remind you about a natural compound that's been used for 3,000 years to help with metabolic health. This compound, of course, is berberine hydrochloride. It has a huge safety record. There's over 17 clinical trials looking at how berberine improves metabolic health and possibly helps with waist circumference and various aspects related to uh, metabolic health, as well as appetite. There's some interesting research how berberine can affect appetite and help suppress appetite because it increases ketones and it might help you with your fast. So if you're struggling with food cravings and you want to get your metabolic health uh, optimized, you might want to consider the Berberine Fasting Accelerator by Myoscience. There's over close to 400 reviews over at myoscience.com. I'll put links in the description below and you can save with the code podcast at checkout. Okay, so the big differences of this study in just 14 days was the average daily energy intake. As I mentioned, the individuals that were randomized to eat the ultra-processed foods consumed roughly 500 extra calories per day in comparison to when they were randomized to eat the unprocessed foods. And as I mentioned, most of these calories were coming from carbohydrate and fat, but not protein. This is very interesting. This really gives even more evidence to this protein leverage hypothesis. And we know that most ultra processed foods are actually devoid in protein or have lower amounts of protein. Think about bagels, croissants, crackers, baked goods, soda, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, desserts, and confectionery, discretionary calories. They usually don't contain protein. So if individuals are not getting enough protein, the protein leverage hypothesis posits that they will consume more energy in search for more protein. 
And so energy consumed at breakfast and lunch was significantly greater during the ultra processed diet, but energy consumed at dinner and snacks was not significantly different between the diets. That, that to me is actually surprising. So I learned something from this, which I think is interesting. So the increased energy intake during the ultra processed diet phase resulted from consuming greater quantities, as I just mentioned, of carbohydrates and fat, but not protein. The remarkable stability of absolute protein intake between the diets, along with the slight reduction in overall protein provided in the ultra processed versus unprocessed diet, 14% versus 15.5% of calories from protein respectively, suggests that the protein leverage hypothesis could partially explain the increase in energy intake with the ultra-processed diet in an attempt to maintain a constant protein intake. Very fascinating. So we do have animal model studies, and I will share with you a recently published study that we broke down and reviewed, highlighting, again, this protein leverage hypothesis. So, you know, one additional take-home here, in addition to the fact that ultra-processed food is very easy to overconsume and that you eat it faster, and that leads to weight gain, is that higher protein diets are inherently more satiating. And if you're, if you're having a low protein diet, you're naturally going to search for more energy because you're not getting enough protein. So I think that's important. So let's look at the body composition changes here. Very interesting that in just two weeks, individuals can gain almost two pounds, almost a pound a week after just eating an extra 500 calories per day of processed food. This is crazy. And, and we know this. If you've been on vacation, if you go uh, to all these you know, holiday parties where summer parties or barbecues, and you start having chips and corn dogs and, and all the sweets and so forth, soda, you start to gain weight pretty quickly. Uh, yes, that's excessive calories, but part of that could be the metabolic changes that we're about to uh, talk about as well. So body fat increased by 0.4 kilograms during the ultra processed phase and decreased by 0.3 kilograms in the unprocessed diet phase. Okay, so this was just fat mass, but body weight overall increased by 2.2 pounds in the ultra process phase. Now, part of that was because there was large fat-free mass changes. Now, this doesn't mean that eating ultra processed food is good for building muscle. Uh, they talk about how this may be due to the extracellular fluid shifts associated with differences in sodium intake between the diets, meaning water retention. So I think that's interesting. What they found is that they also looked at liver fat via MRI, and there wasn't any significant changes in liver fat between the different feeding arms. So I think that's interesting. But remember, this was just over the course of two weeks. And so here's the mass changes, as you can see here, in terms of fat-free mass and fat mass, significant increases in fat mass only in the ultra-processed food feeding arm of the study, not in the unprocessed feeding arm. And of course, um, changes in body weight as well. And this uh, had a really high correlation coefficient, as you can see from part B of this figure. The R value is 0.8. So anything closer to one, meaning the strength of correlation is quite high. So to dumb that down in very layman terms, there's a strong correlation with energy intake from processed food and weight gain over time. So I think that is really important. Uh, what about metabolic rate? There wasn't much of a difference uh, in terms of metabolic rate, sleeping metabolic rate, and so forth. Uh, which was assessed two times throughout the feeding study between the different aspects of the diet intervention, ultra-processed versus unprocessed, which I think is really interesting. All right, so now for the long-awaited glucose and insulin changes as depicted here by figure four. Now, I would have expected more significant shifts in blood glucose, but as you might expect, the individuals were wearing continuous glucose monitors throughout the duration of the study, and to my surprise, I would say to my chagrin, there was not much of a difference in glucose homeostasis changes over the course of just two weeks. Now, perhaps these metabolic shifts take much longer to affect, you know, uh, consuming more and more junk food over time. Maybe it takes three weeks, maybe it takes a month, you know, but you don't get diabetes overnight. The body has amazing compensatory mechanisms. As you can see here, there were more significant shifts over the long tail of insulin. I think this is actually quite interesting because, you know, as many of you know, there's no biologic need, as Dave Feldman has talked a lot about, for insulin to be around in a fasted state. So uh, in the post-meal window, you expect to see insulin, uh, you know, start to surge and peak around 30 to 45 minutes after a meal and then uh, consecutively drop over time. But you can see here the ultra-processed food diet, there were more significant increases in insulin two hours after the glucose tolerance test in comparison to just the unprocessed uh, food intervention. Now, 
you would see probably more significant shifts if this was a 90-day study or six months. You would start to see significant insulin resistance set in. But overall, there weren't, in just two weeks' time, uh, very significant differences in glucose and insulin. But let's talk about the hunger hormones. I think this is really interesting to dive into this. Interestingly, the appetite-suppressing hormone, PYY, increased during the unprocessed diet as compared with the ultra-processed diet and baseline. Also, the hunger hormone ghrelin was decreased during the unprocessed diet compared to baseline. So I think this is really fascinating. Eating unprocessed whole real foods actually increase appetite suppressing hormone, which is great. We PYY increases. PYY is one of the many incretin hormones or gut derived hormones. You've heard a lot about Ozempec and GLP-1. There's CCK, there's PYY, there's ghrelin, there's a bunch of different incretin hormones that help insulin do its job in the post meal window. And the thinking goes that as you develop obesity and obesity-like metabolic complications, the signaling of these hormones gets skewed and that leads to overconsumption of calories and energy and perturbations or abnormalities in metabolic homeostasis after meals. But what we see here is favorable shifts in both ghrelin and PYY in individuals that were randomized to eat unprocessed foods. Those shifts were not seen in the individuals that were eating ultra-processed foods. Now, what was also interesting here is changes in adiponectin. Okay, so adiponectin is generally considered to be a good or favorable adipocytokine. But it did actually decrease a little bit in the folks eating an unprocessed diet as well as total cholesterol, c to protein, uh, the thyroid hormone T3, whereas T4 and free fatty acids increased in the unprocessed diet. So overall, you see favorable shifts, more so leaning towards the individuals that ate unprocessed whole real foods in terms of blood glucose homeostasis, uh, c to protein, uh, thyroid hormone, as well as PYY and ghrelin. After the unprocessed diet, they say fasting glucose and insulin levels tended to decrease compared to baseline, and the homeostasis model assessment of insulin, so-called the HOMA-IR score, was significantly decreased compared to baseline. There were no significant difference in the HOMA-IR score after the ultra-processed diet as compared to either baseline or the unprocessed diet. So overall, you do see favorable shifts in blood glucose homeostasis, but part of this could be because of exercise. The investigators say another possible explanation is that exercise can prevent changes in insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance during overfeeding. Our subjects perform daily cycle ergometry exercises in three 20 minute bouts at constant exercise intensity, corresponding to 30 to 40% of each subject's estimated maximal heart rate reserve. This relatively low intensity exercise was mandated to avoid sedentary behavior and detraining that often occurs during inpatient metabolic ward studies. Indeed, the average physical activity level that was imparted on these subjects was on par with what most free living adults, what most of you would do per day. And so I think that's really interesting. So they wanted to represent a real world situation. It is intriguing to speculate that perhaps even this modest dose of exercise prevented any differences in glucose tolerance or insulin sensitivity between the ultra processed and unprocessed diets. So I think that's really fascinating here. So in conclusion, our data suggests that eliminating ultra-processed foods from the diet decreases energy intake and results in weight loss. Whereas a diet with a large proportion of ultra-processed food energy increases energy intake and leads to weight gain. So that's the take home, my friends. Focus on eating whole, real foods. Ditch the margarine, ditch the Pop-Tarts, ditch the cookies, the crackers, the discretionary calories, sugar-sweetened beverages, those foods are unhealthy. They're easy to overconsume. They lead to weight gain and a whole host of other metabolic uh, problems. So if we focus on whole real foods, that is going to be this, the solution. We have an obesity epidemic. It's estimated that north of 75% of US adults are either overweight or obese, and we're seeing these trends occur in children as well. So we should be focusing on whole real food. Hopefully you enjoyed this breakdown and we'll catch you in a future video down the road.